Today on How We Built It, we take a look at a real-world example of a migration from on-premises monolithic application going to cloud services and microservices-based architecture. We'll go behind the scenes of British online fashion retailer ASOS with this customer base spanning 230 countries worldwide. And we'll take a look at their previous and current technical architectures, their design goals and approach for moving from a locally operated monolith to a fully architected built for cloud online retail system, and their shift to microservices architecture to help expedite the release of new features. So joining me today is Dave Green, a lead architect for ASOS. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. So if you're not familiar with ASOS, it's a great example of a successful online retail store. And a big reason for this is your scale and worldwide footprint. But you didn't start in the cloud, did you? No, that's right. We, we started about 17 years ago in the UK, and cloud really wasn't an option for us back then. Um, since then, we've scaled to over 14 million customers worldwide, and a lot of that's been international growth. So we've had to overcome technical constraints around single language support and multiple currencies. And that's a massive uh, requirement in terms of infrastructure and the growth that you've seen over the last 17 or so years. But what are you actually coming from? So we were in a, a single data center based in London, and that housed everything that we had in there. So we had the, the websites, the, the checkout systems, our content management systems, all of the middleware and reports, and even our warehouse management systems were housed in there. And that grew over time to have uh, more than 200 servers in it. So all of this then was pretty successful, I would, I would think, in terms of all the compute that you have there. You've got a lot of horsepower running it. But what then spurred the shift and the movement into cloud? Why were you thinking about that? So it wasn't just a compute thing and performance thing. Uh, our architecture was starting to hold us back. It was slow to change. Uh, we had a monolithic application that, uh, that can, meant that all of our transactional e-commerce systems, the product reference data, and all the content systems and the customer systems were all locked in together. And on top of that, 17 years ago, the only way to view a website was a desktop browser in there. And the, the upcoming change was that was all we could really support. So you had to shift then to more modern uh, uh, types of, of devices and be able to support those as well, right? That's, that's right. Because this was difficult to change, we had to look around for alternative solutions. So we started layering on third-party solutions to do things like reformat the HTML to be mobile friendly, uh, or even dynamically translate language in the fly. So what were some of the, the business challenges? You mentioned some of the systematic ones. What were some of the business challenges that you had to overcome? Well, the main, the main problem was how inflexible and brittle this was. Every time you tried to change something, it had a ripple effect up and down the, the stack. And that just meant it was slow for us to be able to deliver new features, to keep up with the, um, to keep up with the needs of the business. So when things like the, the birth of mobile and nat native apps took off, it was really hard for us to support that. So you've got this monolith here. It's working, but not quite where you want it to. How do you go about breaking this apart? What we did was we separated out the the, um, the front end concerns so that we had a set of clean APIs uh, and representing our back end services, uh, and then we looked to develop our native and web apps so that they could make use of these new services, and we could roll those out and phased process country by country to minimize the impact on our customers and let us get real production testing in, in the services. Um, the, about the only thing we didn't move out was our payment systems. We didn't quite feel comfortable about moving into the cloud with those just then until we got some more experience under our belt as to how to operate these sort of things in the cloud. So all these things here are microservices uh, that are running basically on an API set. So what's an example of a microservice that you built out for your new app approach? Sure. So um, well, let's take the bag service for as an example. The purpose of the bag service is to um, is to hold the shopping. So customers add things to their bag as they go throughout the shopping journey, um, and so it's for a compute tier where our logic lives. We use um, Azure cloud services and. The microservice whole manages its state and its data independently of the other. So every one of these APIs has its own data store and looks after it. And the services can talk to each other to other services by either using RESTful APIs or asynchronously using the Azure Service Bus. So to give you an example, as a customer adds something to their bag, the, the bag service needs to go and get some product information about that. So it would make a RESTful call across to the product and retrieve it and then add, add state to the, the bag in the, in the database. And then for performance reasons and scalability and resilience purposes, we'll cache that data for a short period of time with uh, making use of Azure Cache. And one of the great advantages here of using microservices is that you can use that to scale it to multiple data centers and regions so you don't have to worry about any peak times or traffic. How does that look? That's right. So we've got about 30 of these services, but we wanted to simplify the operational estate whilst we gained experience with running in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So we're deployed mainly into the European data centers. We've still got our, our data center in, based in London, which is where we, we still keep our payment solution. But most of our customers are European based. So we've deployed all of the services into the, the paired data centers of EU North and EU West. And because they are a paired data center, that means it's easy for us to replicate data back and forth to for things such as DR or HA um, functionality. Um, 
But we also wanted to make sure that our customers in Australia and America were getting a, a great experience. So we looked at the, the services that were um, critical for latency, uh, and we deployed those into the uh, the America cloud region uh, and into the South the South Asia uh, cloud re region. And that's resulted in us having things like our, our identity service uh, and our internal search service de um, deployed globally. Great. So now you've got services running in all these different regions, but how do you actually manage the connections back to your Azure-based services? Well, we make heavy use of Azure Traffic Manager, uh, and it's responsible for taking the customer traffic and routing it to the nearest, to the, the right cloud region. Typically, that would be the, the one that's closest to the customer for the best possible performance. And it's this flexibility combined with the microservices that lets us deploy um, things like payment options or um, delivery choices to, to the customer in our key markets that really, really quickly. And as our, our, our market grows, we get, we will, our cloud footprint will also grow with it. So if we wanted to go into, say, Brazil in a big way, we'd look at deploying our services to the, uh, the, the South American um, data center. So let's switch gears a second in terms of scale. How do we actually manage big traffic peak times like maybe Cyber Monday or Black Friday knowing that these things are coming, what do you do there in terms of managing scale? Well, since we've moved to the uh, the cloud-based microservice approach, we've found that we can cater for far more traffic than we ever could with the on-prem system. Just to give you an idea of scale, I think on, on our, our previous peak on the on-prem system, we were topping out around about nine orders per second. Uh, last Black Friday tw in 2016, um, the, the new stack was catering for things like 33 orders a second. Our product API was uh, getting hit around about 3,500 times a second. I think overall on, that, on the day we had something like 67 million page views. Um, so, so we can cope with the scale. We know the systems can scale and can cope with that. But we tend to run in two different modes. We'll either run in our day-to-day -day scale mode, um, or when we know there's a big peak coming, we'll scale up. Um, and and we, use, we used a, a, a product workload model to understand what we should scale up to. And we're constantly refining that with real customer traffic and data to make sure that that model is accurate. So are you monitoring then every single transaction, every single uh, API use, et cetera? Ab absolutely. We, we're obsessed with making sure the customer has the best possible experience. Uh, and that means that we're doing things like checking the front end, making sure that the performance of, of, of the website is, is where you'd expect it to be. We're monitoring trends. We're looking after, you know, so here you can see how, how we're seeing um, things are performing in different countries. Uh, and we can also be doing things like, you know, seeing how, how did it compare to the activity last week? Uh, and obviously, we're doing that in the back end as well. We're looking at how all the different services are, are reacting. And all of this is linked into our, our operational monitoring and alerting stack. Uh, and if anything were to go out of uh, out, outside of the parameters we'd expect to see, that would trigger an alert, and then the teams would come in and start looking to diagnose what was going on uh, and, and take, uh, take action. So now you've got all this great real-time data to make decisions around scale, but have you thought about using some of the automation around scaling that Azure can provide? So uh, as part of our next-gen compute um, approach, we're, we're looking at what, moving away from cloud services to one of the new models that Microsoft support. So we're looking at things like Azure Service Fabric uh, or Azure Container Services. We think then as we move into that world, then they will have the responsiveness to be able to make use of the uh, uh, of the auto scale. So we're looking at microservices here and how it actually relates to scale, but it also does things in terms of making it easier to release new features and capabilities. Are there some examples where we're using that to make release management easier? So the microservice approach lets us combine features and functionalities together in, to create new experiences for the customers. And because it's a loosely, a loosely coupled architecture, that means that we can scale the development teams as well, so they can all be working on multiple features at once. Um, but let me uh, let, let me show you something that we've been working on. This is our, um, our new visual search for uh, apps. Uh, and the premise here is that you, you see some clothes you might want to buy or, or you like the look of, and you can take a photo of it, or you can scan a photo in a magazine. And here we're using something that might already be in your library. Um, you take a look at, look at the detail, focus in on the detail that you think makes that sort of unique, uh, and you submit that. And then we will give you back a list of products that we think ASOS sells that look, looks like they would look like the thing that you're trying to buy. So how does something like this then work behind the scenes from a microservices standpoint? Sure. So all of this works by make, making use of the uh, the microservices. So when the customer uploads the image, it gets sent to uh, an image recognition service. This is using machine learning, and it's it's consumed all of the data from the product catalog and the product service, and that product data allows it to tag metadata to the products so that it can uh, it can join that up with the the image that's been uh, submitted, and then it's doing things like a real time inventory check to make sure that we're not offering products that are already out of stock to the customer uh, and returns that list back to the, uh, the client. So really interesting to see how you moved your monolithic on-premises application, one that's built for cloud using microservices. But for the folks watching at home, are there any tips that you can give them for their moves into the cloud? 
Sure. So I would think about uh, how do you simplify the estate as much as possible before you move into the cloud. Work with the simplest run state, run estate that you can whilst you get that cloud experience. Uh, I'd also think about how you design for failure, because um, failure in the cloud can be a little bit different than designing for failure on, on a, in an on-premise solution. Uh, and then finally, I'd bring it back to that sort of DevOps approach to monitoring. Monitor, 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 monitor everything, because telemetry is life in, when you're operating in the cloud. So keep it simple. Make sure that you're designing for failure that might be different in the cloud, and also making sure that you can monitor to keep that DevOps process across the life cycle. Thanks for joining us today, Dave. And you can catch up with Dave and the entire ASOS team on the Microsoft Tech Community. Details for that are at the link below. That's all the time we have for this episode of How We Built It. Thanks for watching.